Well, I want to take this opportunity to thank um, all of you attendees out there in, in Zoom land for uh, attending our, our first ever Zoom virtual legislator forum. I'm sure you're all missing the, uh, the breakfast spread that we, we normally offer uh, for these events. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully our next one uh, will be able to do that. I, I, you know, fingers crossed, of course. Um, and I'd like to thank um, all of our legislators who are here this morning with us. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and, and uh, share some conversation with our, our members. Um, so I, I think we'd, I'd like to start out by giving each of you a, a chance to introduce yourself, uh, who you represent, and what uh, committees you're serving on and what particular uh, legislation that you're working on um, that you think might appeal um, or be of interest to our membership. So um, I'm just going to start with, with the corner. John uh, Gannon, Representative Gannon, if you'd like to start. Um, go ahead. Oh, I also wanted, before you do, I want to say one thing. Uh, I welcome questions. So any questions that, that, that you folks would like to uh, ask, I have received a few of them ahead of time and I, and I will relay those to the, to the uh, legislators. Um, you may uh, enter your question in the Q&A or you can enter it into the chat and I will be monitoring that to make sure we get those questions out to the legislators. So again, uh, sorry for interrupting you, John, go ahead. Um, thank you, Greg, and thanks everyone for joining this morning. Um, my name is John Gannon. I represent Wyndham Six, which is made up of the towns of Halifax, Whitingham, and Wilmington. I live in Wilmington. Uh, I serve as vice chair of House Government Operations, and I've been on that committee since I was elected to the legislature, um, and I'm serving my third term. Um, so I, I thought I'd just focus on three issues um, that government operations um, is focused on that, you know, either directly or tangentially um, involve businesses. Um, one, I'm just gonna to touch on is redistricting. Um, as many of you know, we will be redistricting um, House and Senate seats um, next year. Um, we have started that process already because of the delay in the census data. Um, so we've had to replan how that process is going. And just to know, Wyndham County, at least based on preliminary census data, has seen a loss in population. I think all but one house district has lost population. And I believe our Senate district has as well. Um, so I think that's something that, you know, should be a concern for everybody in Wyndham County. Um, another issue that I want to address on is a, a bill that we do every year involving the Office of Professional Regulation. Um, usually not a, a sexy bill, but um, this year there was an area that was very important to me and my constituents, which dealt with pharmacies. Um, many of the chain pharmacies in, in the Deerfield Valley and in Bennington, I'm not sure about the Brattleboro area, were not serving their customers very well. Um, just regular prescriptions were getting delayed. People were being called back and forth. Um, so we dramatically changed um, the unprofessional conduct regulations for pharmacies, specifically chain pharmacies. So that if a individual pharmacy um, was found to be in violation of the unprofessional conduct standards, um, and it was based on business practices for the corporation, all pharmacies um, in that chain could be held responsible um, and face penalties. Um, so I think that's important. Um, the final issue that I want to touch on and probably the issue I've spent the most time on is pensions. Um, I started working on this before the session even started. Um, we have continued to work on it. It is a critical issue um, to address. I mean, it's important that our state employees and our teachers have a secure retirement, um, but it's also important to the credit rating of the state and to our ability to access um, the securities markets. And so we are really trying to work to come up with a plan that will make sure that we secure our, our retirement for our things, that it will not hurt people who are already in retirement or near retirement. Um, and so we continue to really work on that and come up with a thoughtful plan um, to, to make sure that we do have a secure retirement. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, John. Uh, Mike, Representative Merwicki. Thanks, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, well, actually John and I serve on the same committee. So I'm gonna take a little bit of a, a left turn away from what we did and in, in the Senate, uh, Jeanette also serves on government operations and, and they've, they'll touch on some of the big pieces. And I'm gonna give a little, little wider 
perspective on what we're doing. Um, when, when we started the session, uh, carrying over from last year, COVID, COVID, COVID. Uh, we've, we've had to deal with a lot of things, uh, helping, first of all, keep Vermonters healthy. And, and we give the governor a lot of credit for, for following the science. And, and I think it's, it's shown Vermonters have stepped up. Um, but I believe we're really dealing with three pandemics here in Vermont and across the country. And COVID, is, of course, is the big one, but right behind COVID, and as COVID fades away, we're still gonna have to deal with climate and systemic racism. And, and we are looking at all those things because some people say that what's happened from COVID is a dress rehearsal for what could happen from climate. If you look what happened in Texas this winter, who would have thunk it? But there it is. The, the new normal is changing for all of us. And, and we're, we're, we're doing a lot. Uh, last year, we, we created the, the Global Solutions Council, which is a large group setting standards for us to meet. Uh, we're going to be doing things like expanding, broadly expanding weatherization because transportation, home heating are the biggest pieces of, of Vermont's climate, uh, the carbon footprint. So th those things affect the economy too. So if people are looking at, at the react reality to business, if we don't do this, this is gonna hurt business in the long run. And I would say the same thing for systemic racism. Um, the nation is changing, Vermont is changing. Um, Brattleboro High School, 16% students of color now. Huge change from years ago. But the reality is that everyday life for people in color of Vermont uh, pretty hard to take. When I've asked people of color that I work with, are things as bad as, as people are saying and to a person they say, yeah. And I said, give me an example. How would you feel if every time you went into a store, you got followed? How would you feel if you went to buy gas and the clerk comes out as you're pumping ostensibly to make sure you actually pay? I know someone who says, when I don't wear a suit and tie and go into a store, that's my reality, that I get followed. Little things like that, and, and then crossing over into the world of business, because we are going to try and make, make some changes to help BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, uh, make it easier. Curtis Reed uh, has some great ideas, and uh, Sarah Coffey and I have been working with Curtis to try and bring some of these ideas to make business easier and better for people of color in Vermont. And the reality is, as we continue to look for workers in Vermont, as Curtis has been saying, Curtis Reed has been saying for years, uh, if we did more and better outreach to people of color in urban areas to see that Vermont can be a welcoming place, uh, we would bring, be able to bring a lot of uh, qualified people to Vermont. So I, I will stop there, but um, hopefully we can, this can generate more discussion as we move forward. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Representative Boslin. Oh, hi, I guess I'm already unmuted. So um, I'm uh, Michelle Boslin. I represent Westminster, um, Domerston and Putney along with uh, Representative Merwicki. And um, I serve on the Corrections and Institutions Committee so part of our work is about half of our work, I would say, is related to the correctional system. And the other half is uh, institutions, but the, the largest part of that that we've been working on so far involves the capital bill, which will become the capital budget. And um, of course, those are statewide, uh, there's a statewide impact to what we're deciding there, but many of the uh, issues we'll be deciding about will impact uh, Wyndham County. So for example, we're looking at putting a new roof on the courthouse in Brattleboro. Um, the capital budget also includes things like funding for community art centers, historic preservation grants. There are um, literally the whole, the whole bill is I think $124 million and um, many, many areas of those will end up touching Wyndham County. And we should be uh, making the final decisions on what will and won't be in the bill uh, by this Friday. Uh, so yeah, that's I think the part that would be most relevant for Wyndham County would be what falls under the capital budget uh, proposals. Thank you, Michelle. Senator Bayland. Welcome. Morning, Greg. How are you? Good morning. I'm well, thanks. How are you? Good. Nice to see you. 
Okay. I think what makes the most sense. So I'm I'm Senator Becca Ballant. I live here in Brattleboro, and I'm one of your two senators for Wyndham County. The other being Jeanette White, who you'll hear from uh, in a moment. I serve on the Economic Development and Housing Committee in the morning, and the Appropriations Committee in the afternoon. And I am the new Senate uh, President Pro Tem. And so what I wanted to say is our work in the Senate uh, has really been organized around four broad themes. And I'm gonna touch on three of them and I'm gonna leave the, the last one to Jeanette because that's really in her, her bailiwick. So we have been doing a lot of work on supporting kids and their health and well-being, and their education. Number two, assisting workers and families and three, keeping our businesses and downtowns viable. The fourth one being restoring faith in our democratic institutions, which Jeanette's gonna talk about um, her, her very exciting bill on mail-in balloting in just a minute. So in terms of the work that we've done, um, a lot of the, the work that I've done in both those committees has been about um, allocating federal dollars, both in the two tranches um, in the previous year, and of course, we're about to get another huge infusion of cash from the federal government. And our challenge will be to figure out what money can we swap out from our general fund budget uh, and swap in federal dollars. Some is a is a one to one correlation that we do have the freedom to do that. Other things uh, we aren't able to. For example, it would be wonderful if we could spend hundreds of millions of dollars shoring up our um, our public sector. Um, pension program, but there is actually a provision in this federal bill saying we explicitly cannot do that. And so we're trying to free up other money that we can, we can spend on that um, from the, uh, the uh, general fund. So looking at our work on supporting kids uh, locally, the Everyone Eats program has been very popular, highly successful. We were able to get more funding for that in the budget adjustment bill. Um, thinking about just disinvolved youth housing uh, was also in the Budget Adjustment Act that we passed. Right now, we're working on money for literacy programs in our fast track uh, COVID relief bill, a school disciplinary advisory council also in the fast track bill, funds to the food bank, Vermont farmers uh, to families food box program, also looking at um, more CRF dollars going to school indoor air quality. And um, of course, also looking at how we can move forward on the recommendations around the weighting study and how uh, pupils are weighted uh, within public education. So under the heading of keeping workers and families uh, healthy and safe, we uh, were able to pass millions of dollars in relief for back rent in our budget adjustment. Um, infusing the Vermont State College system with also um, millions of dollars in support, broadband investments, uh, weatherization of homes, more pandemic emergency unemployment compensation, more money to Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, more money to reach up programs, um, and also looking at um, finally, finally passing a rental registry, hopefully, and a rental housing code enforcement bill. Um, and looking at our, our businesses and, and communities, we passed um, many uh, provisions last year related to economic relief. We've got another $10 million in economic recovery grants coming in our fast track bill. Um, we're also looking at additional $300 million, $3 million investment in um, our agency of agriculture for food markets and for working lands. Um, a lot more work going um, towards the issue of broadband and remote work. Also looking at our nursing uh, shortage um, and finally passing a nursing compact. So we have done a tremendous amount. I know I, I went over that quickly because I wanted you to understand the, the breadth of the work that we've been doing in, in moving out these funds. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Senator White if I could to talk about her very exciting uh, work on elections. Sure, Senator White. Okay, thanks. So I um, I am Jeanette White and I'm the other Senator from Wyndham County. And I miss seeing all of your members here in front of us. So I'm very sad that not to see people. Um, I serve on judiciary in the morning and chair government operations in the afternoon. And before I um, get to that, I'm, I want to bring up a couple other issues that we've been dealing with. In judiciary, 
We have been working on clarifying the uh, process relating to competency to stand trial and um, insanity as a defense. It's a very complicated area of the law and I think we've um, clarified it a lot. We also, as part of justice reinvestment, um, to, people suffer for years and years and years with criminal records and um, it impacts their ability to have jobs and to uh, have housing, everything. So we've been expanding access to expungement of records and um, working on earned time for those who are incarcerated in order to apply for parole earlier and to be released from probation earlier. Um, we also did something that probably everybody in the world would love, but um, it's not gonna get a lot of press, but we prohibited robocalls. However that plays out, I don't know, but there is a law now in Vermont that prohibits robocalls. So on um, government operations, we have um, in terms of, I, I think economic development and um, business opportunities, we are making changes to the cannabis statute that will make it um, <clears throat> more easier to administer and more just. We are, in terms of youth, um, what Becca talked about was, uh, and we are making identifying in details in the initial rest records of juveniles confidential. So that's identifying records or identifying information of juveniles in their initial arrest record will not be public information. What Becca was talking about in the elections bill is a huge change. And there's so many details in it. It's about a 40 page bill that I'm not gonna go into any detail, but I'm just going to say that we, we spent a lot of time on this. We started with over a hundred proposals from people about what to do about our elections. And we decided to focus on the big issue, which is um, mailing out ballots to all active voters in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the general election. So that's the November general elections. Every active voter, an active voter means somebody who hasn't been challenged. If they've been challenged, they won't um, be sent a ballot. But if they're on the active list, they will be sent a ballot in the general election. Election. We saw that it increased tremendously the, um, the turnout rate this last year. It was done by our faithful elections division in 10 months. They, and it included a lot, of, a lot of groups, including chambers and business groups, and to do education and advocacy around how this was going to work. And it increased the uh, voting record a lot. And it is not a part, this is not a partisan issue. This is an issue of the foundation of our democracy and we need to get more people involved. So we'll continue to work on that. And I, I call it mail out as opposed to mail in because there are still all the options available to turn your ballot in. You can actually go to the polls and turn it in if you want, but it, a it will be mailed out to every active voter. So I'm happy on or offline to talk more about that if people have um, detailed information they would like. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, we'll turn now to uh, Representative Kornheiser, Emily. Good morning, everyone. Really glad to be here with you all, drinking our own coffee in our own homes and offices. Um, I am one of three representatives from Brattleboro. I represent West Brattleboro and a little stretch of Canal Street as it hits Guilford. Um, I guess it's technically Route 5 over there. And want to share Rep Tolino's regrets that he is not able to make it here to be with all of us today. Um, I currently serve on the Ways and Means Committee and on the Joint Fiscal Committee. I'm vice chair of the Ways and Means Committee. And um, this year, some bills that we are focusing on there that might be of interest to all of you um, is continuing to work on ed funding. We were able to keep, um, the yield bill hasn't quite passed out yet, but it looks like our rates are going to stay right around last year's, which is great news compared to some of the projections that we had in December. So I wanna make sure that you're all aware of that. We're working on um, some exemptions to sales tax for manufacturing um, to really look at 
not just the individual objects that are involved in manufacturing, but how all those, those pieces fit together. And that if um, an individual piece of manufacturing equipment is part of the entire manufacturing process, that would also be exempt from taxation. We are looking um, for, I think, the third biennium in a row, but seem to be moving forward on um, changing the sales factor on how we calculate corporate taxation to really come into line with all of the other New England states. And um, also moving into a combined reporting mechanism. And again, happy to talk more about that anytime offline. And I have office hours um, every Sunday at 11 a.m. via Zoom. If anyone wants to join me to get into the weeds of tax policy, or please feel free to send me an email anytime to set up a private conversation. Um, and then outside of ways and means, really excited. Um, I don't think any of us here today are on human services. So just share that I'm really excited that one of the bills that I was the lead sponsor on, our big child care bill for the year, um, passed out of the human services committee last week and um, is heading over to its next committee stop. And we're very hopeful about it. And that's really continuing to do some very serious work to lower the cost of childcare for families um, and really expand the number of families that are eligible for that childcare cost so that families really regardless of income can get the childcare that they need. It's also looking at expanding the childcare system so that folks who wanna enter the field have an easier time getting to the field and have a much more sustainable life once they are in that field. So really, really excited about that bill. I think I will stop there. There's so much more to say and so much happening and looking forward to hearing from everyone else. Great. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Representative Burke. Good morning, Molly. Good morning. Thanks, Greg, for organizing this. I know it wasn't easy to figure out everybody's Same schedules. Uh, so I am uh, in my 13th year in the legislature and my 13th year on the Transportation Committee. We just passed a bill out of committee on Friday that I am so excited about. It just, uh, it's, it encompasses so many wonderful things and um, complements a lot from uh, federal money. So uh, uh, things that might be of interest to people in Brattleboro is that we did add some money to the general town highway aid. And that means specifically that Brattleboro will be getting about $22,000 extra which is just general aid that can be used for a variety of different, different things. It's not a huge amount of money, but it's something. And in addition to that, we've um, added more money to the, uh, to the pot of grants for structures and for um, class two roadway. Those are grants that towns can apply for. They don't, you know, sort of a cycle and maybe a town gets one every six years or so. But we've also um, uh, raised the cap so that it, it uh, I'm sorry, raise the amount of the grant. It used to be 175,000 was the, was the amount, the, the highest amount of a grant a town could get. We raised it to 200,000. Uh, the other thing is that the Agency of Transportation has just uh, agreed to provide sort of some interim, interim funding for uh, Western Avenue. We all know how bad it is and they are going to contribute $70,000 for repairs. That road is not scheduled to be rebuilt uh, and it does need rebuilding because the, the uh, underlayer is, is very um, problematic. And that's, but they are gonna contribute $70,000 to just sort of a, some immediate fixes, which is really good news because it wasn't really in the budget. Um, and uh, another thing in the bill is that we are, or in the, in the budget is we are going to be putting in $3.5 million into the downtown transportation fund and raising the, um, the match from, uh, used to be 50%, 50% towns and 50% uh, state funds and raising that to 80-20. So the towns will only be paying 20%. That's a fund that, that um, just a lot of sort of transportation related amenities for downtowns, things that makes downtowns more attractive to people, more pedestrian improvements, bicycle improvements, uh, planters, benches, just a lot of different things like that. And that was a program that last year we had struggled. We finally got like $100,000 extra into that fund and which made it about $500,000. Now we're putting 3.5 million in and 
And if appropriations goes along with the governor's request, um, it could go up to as high as five. So pretty exciting. And along with that, another bill that's moving uh, through the house is um, 159, H159, a better places program. And it's sort of similar, smaller grants for downtowns. And these are for um, designated downtowns and village centers. Uh, bicycle and bicycle incentives. Um, we're, we're doing a bunch of incentives for electric vehicles, uh, electric vehicles for new vehicles, for different um, people, low income people and for um, middle income people and also a program that's going to go with Capstone Community Action for uh, incentives for used vehicles to really help the, the, the most um, people at the lowest um, economic levels to be able to afford a better car, have cheaper transportation in the long run. And that's pretty exciting. Uh, that actually program is administered by Capstone and the head of Capstone is former transportation secretary and gubernatorial candidate, Sue Minter. So we've been hard, working hard on that. Um, and uh, I think I'll just, oh, and then that will might uh, help our two downtown bike shops there, there's been a $200 incentive from Green Mountain Power for uh, electric uh, bicycles. And that has meant really great sales for both bike shops, both um, Rattleboro Bikes and uh, specialized, special, specialized sports. So um, the, we have a, I was able to get in a small extra incentive for um, people under a certain income, an extra $200 just for the first 250 people who um, apply. But anyway, it was just sort of to, to recognize the importance of, of, of that economically. And uh, in terms of, you know, being some people actually in Brattleboro, you've probably seen riding cargo bikes are able to actually get rid of one car. Uh, and, and I think that I just want to say one more thing is that I think this bill is historic in terms of the amount of money that we are putting in to transforming our our transportation system and uh, electrify it. So uh, it's a it's a really exciting it's the bill that I'm I'm just so thrilled that we were we've been able to do this and hopefully we can continue on this path to get to what our our sort of avowed goals are supposed to be. We are supposed to have like 90,000 electric vehicles on the road by by 2025. I don't know where I think we're going to get there. There are about 4,000 right now, but the um, process is accelerating. More vehicles are coming online, trucks, all wheel drive vehicles. It's a really exciting moment in transportation. So that's it. Thank, Thank you. you, Molly. Um, let's uh, jump down to Representative Goldman. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Good morning. It's good to see everybody's faces. Um, on my screen and everyone in the background too, I know you're there. Um, I'm Leslie Goldman. I represent Wyndham Three along with Carolyn Partridge, Northern Power to the County, Athens, Brookline, Grafton, Rockingham, a slice of Westminster and Wyndham. I serve on the healthcare committee and we've, I'm gonna talk about four bills that we've been working on. First bill is H210 which is really an important bill. It's the Health Equity Act. Um, COVID has broken open the cracks in our healthcare disparities for people of color um, and LGBTQ plus people. And we wanna be able to take action in the healthcare system to recognize these disparities um, and improve outcomes for those populations. So initially it was a bigger bill. It was 28 pages to start and landed at 22. Um, this, there will be an office of um, health equity at some point in the future, but it is going to start out of the office of racial equity and will evolve from there. Our second bill, we uh, voted out on Friday and we were actually some of us in tears when we voted to extend benefits to undocumented uh, pregnant women and children. Um, the testimony we received from um, th this population was so moving that be able to take action, even in this small slice, had a lot of meaning for us. So that was an important moment in our committee. 
Um, and that voted out unanimously. And it was unclear that that was gonna happen, but it did, and that was really important. A third bill was a really interesting experience for me. There are like over 400 bills, I think, in the House at this point. It's an incredible number. Um, some look at very small slices of things. So one bill that came up was to um, allow mental health practitioners from out of state to practice in state. Um, we then heard testimony from um, the Office of Professional Regulation, Vermont Medical Society, and realized that this opportunity should be afforded to all our professionals um, so that everyone in Vermonter can have access to care from practitioners outside of our state via telehealth. So what came out of this was a work group that has many stakeholders to expand. And what's particularly interesting is this is an example of how our world is moving. It's gonna be a new mo world moving on platforms, blurring state boundaries. But what really impressed me was the Office of OPR was so important in protecting Vermonters um, health and experiences. And that was really impressive to me. And the fourth conversation some of you may have heard of is about the Middlesex Secure Residential Facility that's being proposed by the Department of Mental Health. That is a very complex issue, really crossing all levels of our mental health system, which has led to testimony from all levels of our mental health system and a very important conversation. And we will be needing to come to some closure on that this week. So I think that's it for our committee at the moment. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, Emily, Representative Long. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks everyone for being here today. I wish we could be in person. Um, next time we will next be. Uh, I, I represent uh, the towns of um, Marlboro, Newfane and Townsend, slice of the center of Wyndham County. I, I just wanted to quick say, you got, we have a really great delegation here. You've been hearing from them. There's several others. And I think that our county actually is really well represented in the legislature. We have a chair. We have a bunch of vice chairs sitting here. We have members of money committees. Um, and um, I happen to be the newly elected uh, leader in the House, majority leader in the House. We have a pro tem here in Wyndham County. So I just wanted to give a shout out to my colleagues, first of all, because we are really strong county, well represented in the legislature, you know, and, and so I'm not gonna dive too far into legislation because folks are doing that. Um, the rest of you are doing that, but I did wanna just mention, I also serve on the healthcare committee along with Leslie. So I won't mention those bills, but really great work going on um, in, both the healthcare committee and all of our committees. Um, we as a, as a legislature and as a house, we have been working really hard on our stated priorities that we stated right from the very beginning. We have a new speaker. She has come out very clearly in support of broadband, childcare, Vermont State Colleges. Laura will probably speak about the work on broadband. We're so proud of that work. You heard already about the child care, the work on child care. It's so critical to our to Vermonters. Um, some great stuff coming out about Vermont State Colleges. We're going to be hearing about that when we get some of the um, information uh, that we are working on right now. Um, budget work, as you know, begins in the House, and we've been really focused on working families and, frankly, COVID relief. Um, that's the that's been our focus all along, and we're going to continue to focus on that new stimulus package that's coming out of um, the federal government. We are thrilled to be able to have that. We're working closely with our congressional delegation on that to make sure that we can get some clarity around the restrictions um, and rules around that. We may not get clarity, total clarity until uh, for quite some time yet, but um, you know, we will, we're, we're really closely connected on that to make sure that we are using that money in the best way we can. I know Senator Ballant mentioned about pensions and so did Representative Gannon. That is a real focus of ours. And while there are restrictions, as Senator Ballant said, um, on, on the new stimulus package and whether we could use that on pensions, but we are working very hard on figuring out other ways to take advantage of this opportunity that we have right now to make sure that we are doing the best thing we can for our employees in this state. So I don't wanna take up too much time because I know we wanted to have um, 
time for questions. So I'll just leave it at that and um, allow the rest to speak. Thank you. Terrific, thank you. And uh, last but certainly not least, Laura, uh, Representative Sibelia. Good morning, uh, Representative Sibelia. I represent uh, Route 100, basically, um, except uh, John's portion, uh, the southern part of that. So Wardsboro, Dover, uh, Searsburg, Somerset, Reedsboro, Stamford, and a little bit of Whitingham with John. Uh, so I serve as the vice chair on the House Energy and Technology Committee. Uh, and I will tell you about the broadband bill that we have passed out and which is continuing to evolve with the exciting news um, out of uh, DC about additional funds for infrastructure. The bill number is uh, H360. Um, it's, it's a pretty long bill. Um, let me tell you conceptually what it does. Uh, this bill builds off of the uh, previous work that we have done um, in 2019, I like to say we essentially uh, said to Vermonters, no one is coming to save you. Uh, we do not have the funds to do this. We have a model for community broadband uh, in Vermont that is functioning. That would be the CUD model through EC Fiber. Uh, and we are going to put together a toolbox uh, of tools to help communities um, accelerate that model throughout the state. Um, and uh, the Wyndham County delegation um, was pretty active in, in making that move forward. Um, with that legislation, we added um, personnel at the Department of Public Service to work with those new CUDs, as well as some new funding at VEDA. Uh, and since that time, we have seen, I believe it is, and I really need to get this number locked down, I, I think we have nine CUDs at this point throughout the state. Um, virtually um, all of the state, uh, except for uh, in county, uh, is either uh, in an active CUD or in the act of forming a CUD. Uh, and so uh, we're seeing some common challenges with the CUDs. We told them um, in 2019, we want you to create a plan before you go to VITA to access funds. We're gonna give you money for planning. We're gonna give you this person. Um, and we want you to tell us how to get there and how to, how to make it pencil out. Um, and they've been doing that. And so as they're doing that, they're coming up with a common shared uh, challenge. Uh, these volunteers, there are 300 volunteers in Vermont now working on these CDs. Uh, and they are coming forward with plans uh, and, and work and saying, we now need help figuring out how to put together the financing and implementation plans for, uh, for the work that you asked us to do. Uh, and that's a pretty common uh, issue that they're experiencing. So this year in H360, uh, at a very high level, what we are doing is taking the next step. We are building on our past work. Uh, we are putting in place, uh, proposing to put in place, hopefully our colleagues in the Senate will agree with us, uh, the Community Broadband Authority. Um, and this uh, is similar and different from the previous uh, VTA. Vermont Telecommunications Authority, which folks may remember. Uh, that entity was charged with building public infrastructure, kind of, you know, anything of its own uh, to build out the middle mile. Uh, this entity, the CBA, the Community Broadband Authority, will be charged with building out the plans that our CUDs have put together. Uh, we have two principles that we've been employing with this bill. Um, one is universality, making sure that we actually get to the last uh, to the last person, and the other is accountability. Um, and this is because we have no means of really uh, making private providers provide coverage um, or penalizing them if they don't. Um, and so they 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 don't provide coverage where it's not uh, especially profitable to do so. So uh, the CUDs represent both. Um, uh, we think the best chance of universality and uh, and accountability because CUDs are formed by votes of uh, select boards to join them. And so uh, each town has uh, up to three members on a CUD. So this bill um, puts that uh, community broadband authority together. Its purpose is to help, uh, as I said, the CUDs get their plans financed and, and, uh, and uh, built. We think that there are, uh, we think that public funds for broadband 
need to go to public entities and uh, they, uh, we, should, we should not be directly providing any more public funds directly to private entities. We do hope to see that all private providers um, as well as utilities um, participate in helping us get to the last mile. And we've provided means in this bill uh, for all private providers to access public dollars, uh, as well as um, some, uh, some ideas that are in this bill and some other uh, things that are moving forward with our utilities to have our utilities um, uh, move this forward. Those are really the, the, the big concepts. Um, it, the bill is long and kind of complex, um, but it's, it's basically pretty simple. Uh, it's, it's just providing additional capacity to, uh, to get now what appear will be pretty significant um, funds uh, into the CUDs who've been doing the work that we asked them to do. So I think very, very exciting. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that unless anyone thinks I've missed something critical there. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'd like to go, uh, thank you all for, for sharing what you're working on. Um, it's all very impressive. It sounds like there's a lot of legislation going through the, through the state house. Um, I wanted to jump to some, some questions that I've received uh, to put out there. I, I got this uh, this morning and I'm just gonna read it to you. It's, it's not that long. Um, a group of healthcare professionals and concerned community members have come together to look at healthcare needs, gaps and opportunities in the coming decades for senior citizens in Wyndham County. As you know, Vermont and Wyndham County specifically has a significantly disproportionate number of aging citizens. How do you see Vermont planning for this graying demographic and the accompanying changes in essential public services? And how do you see Act 156 impacting this rapidly changing landscape. I welcome anyone to would like to speak to that. Becca, Senator Balin. So one thing that I want um, this, this person to know, um, we're very concerned in the Senate Health and Welfare Committee about the, the demographic uh, shifts uh, in Vermont, and yes, they are they are acute in Wyndham County. And one of the things that that we're looking at is um, having a, a task force put together this summer to look at the possibility of getting a, a waiver from the federal federal government to be able to to lower the age at which people can participate in Medicare. Um, we don't know. Um, whether that will be successful, but, it, but it's one of, of many aspects um, of our work to try to lower healthcare costs for all. And by doing that, it frees up other money in the system for these long-term uh, care concerns for, for the elderly uh, throughout the state. We do um, have the dubious distinction of, of ranking very high in uh, the country for uh, folks in, um, in their elder years living in poverty and elderly couples living in poverty. And, and as many of the folks on the call know, we also have issue with many of the people who are living in poverty are actually women uh, for, for all of the, the social factors that contribute to that. So um, I know that I can, can speak on behalf of, of my committee in the, in the Senate. We would look forward to hearing uh, more about the work that, that this coalition is doing because the southern part of the state is feeling this acutely, um, and and I would be interested to know uh, the very uh, the variety of of aspects of this problem that you're looking at, so we can try to address address it in the coming years. Thank you. Anyone else care to comment on that? Um, another question about. Um, this relates to the Department of Labor. Um, Given the two serious personal data breaches experienced recently at the Vermont Department of Labor affecting thousands of Vermonters, is there anything the legislature can do to help rectify this major problem and rebuild trust in the department? Senator White. Well, I, this isn't really an answer at all, but we could probably appropriate enough money so that they could have a decent um, system to work with a de decent infrastructure. Representative Kornheiser. 
I think one of the things that we saw at the Department of Labor um, at the beginning of the pandemic that we've seen the continued ripple effects of um, into now is what chronic underfunding and underinvestment in state government looks like. And so there are IT solutions for that. There's long-term staffing reforms that are needed. There's taking a long, hard policy look at what the purpose of the department is and how it can best serve Vermonters. And so I think some of, the, some of that we're doing quickly. Um, we just had a very, a bill move very rapidly through the House and the Senate in order to get benefits, um, federal benefits to Vermonters faster. And we have the tax department. Um, I think that bill's about to leave the Senate. We have the tax department given permission to work with the Department of Labor to verify um, some of the data in order to strengthen that because we have a very strong tax department. But then there are the longer term reforms that we need to look at. What, you know, how can we have an IT department that really meets the needs of contemporary society and Vermonters needs? How can we make sure that employers are um, really able to communicate effectively to the Department of Labor about their needs and flexibilities? How can folks who have been waiting for benefits for months move faster through the system and feel seen and heard by government? And those are some of the longer term reforms that the Commerce Committee is gonna be picking up after crossover and into next year. And I think it's something that every single person in the legislature, regardless of party affiliation is deeply invested in because we've all heard from constituents across the spectrum about the real need to invest in this part of state government. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, shift. Greg, oh yes, be sorry. Before you shift, can I just say one thing? Just I, I'd like to just reassure people, just because I my committee has spent hours and hours and hours uh, working with Department of Labor, taking testimony, trying to understand what happened. I just wanna be clear. It is not a classic data breach in the sense, nobody hacked into the computer. Nobody downloaded information from the mainframe. I just wanna be clear about that. It's not as if one person or, or bad actors hold all of the information. It was a mistake that was made by an individual at Department of Labor when they were downloading information from the mainframe onto a spreadsheet. And it, I'm not excusing the mistake. It was a mistake, but it was an individual mistake. It was not malfeasance or bad actors, which is really, really different from what happened at UVM this past year in terms of hacking into the computer. So I just wanna reassure people that um, although it was not a good thing that happened, um, we, we do have a handle on why it happened so that we don't get in this situation again. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ballant. Uh, Mike, Senator Representative Merwicki. I just wanted to quickly add something and in, in, to follow up with what Emily said is that uh, this is reflective of the lack of investments so that when we need things, we don't have them. And we are looking to, to upgrade the computer systems. For instance, the Department of Labor's system is 30 years old. The Agency of Human Services system is 40 years old. Uh, and one of the things that, that I've been espousing is that other states like Rhode Island have gone to cloud computing. Um, the large... Uh, Entities like Amazon, Google, uh, IBM uh, are, are selling bandwidth to use to use their systems, and that might be a way we could actually spend less money, uh, keep the systems updated, and more secure. Thank you. Um, I've got a question in, or it, it's more of a comment, but from the in the in the chat, it's from. Uh, Annie Guyon at the uh, Wyndham County Humane Society. And she writes that uh, H-172 would ban recreational trapping and bear hounding, hunting of bears with hounds. A survey done by Vermont Law School showed that 70% of Vermonters are against recreational trapping and the Wyndham County Humane Society is strongly in favor of H-172. And we sincerely hope you all will keep an eye on it and support it as it moves through the legislative process. Anyone have a comment on that or? I, I actually, this is Leslie, I have a comment on it. Um, I did a Zoom meeting with some constituents who um, brought up that bill with the similar concerns that Annie has. And what we found out is it's still on the wall. Um, so we were talking about different ways to get it, the committee to take it up, um, natural resources, fish and wildlife. So 
I think at this point, it's about putting pressure on the chair and other members of the committee to see if they're willing to take it up. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a question for uh, 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 for uh, uh, Representative Kornheiser. Um, this is from uh, Susan McMahon at the Landmark Trust USA. She writes, I'm concerned uh, our nonprofit historic preservation organization may not be able to move, be able to provide short-term rental in our historic properties because of the requirement to live in the property. We are based in Vermont and our stewardship model is how we protect historic properties. Short-term rentals. Who knew that it was such a contentious issue in Vermont? Um, sorry, that was a little bit of a Monday morning joke. Um, I, and I'm sorry if you didn't think it was funny. So this bill, um, which I um, co-sponsored with Rep Kelly Payala from Londonderry and um, Representative Colburn from Burlington, is intended to regulate short-term rentals. It is not intended to shut them down entirely. And the language of the bill, I think, does not make that as clear as it is in context. And I'm happy to follow up with much more extensive conversation with anyone who writes to me. I've been having many conversations about this. The idea is that we want to make sure that our short-term rentals are regulated to make them safe and to make sure that they're in places that are sort of appropriately zoned for them. And so the idea is that properties where someone is living on that property, whether that is in a farm or a cabin or um, a mother-in-law apartment, I really hate that expression, but can't seem to ever find another one for that, um, that folks who are sort of living really near a property have much less of a need for regulation than short-term rentals that are um, really buildings that are purchased explicitly for the purpose of short-term rentals, that those properties need to be regulated much more closely and much more like a regular hospitality business, because that is in fact what they are, they're hospitality businesses. And so by creating a registry and by having stronger regulations, we can make sure that the Agency of Commerce is strongly supporting those hospitality businesses the same way that they are for our hotels and bed and breakfasts. And we can make sure that everyone is safe who is coming to the state and the folks who are living in the communities with the folks who are coming to the state. We know that during the pandemic, we had a very, very hard time getting in touch with those online rental platforms in order to tell them that we are not accepting guests anymore here in the lovely state of Vermont. And so wanna make sure that we have that registry in place and that we have those supports in place for anyone who is engaging in a hospitality business. I will also say that that bill is on the wall and not going anywhere. So. If you are feeling nervous about it, I am here to calm your energies. And if you would like to understand the motivations better that I have around the safety, the regulation, leveling the playing field with other hospitality businesses and our deep, deep shortage of long-term rentals available in Wyndham County for folks who are working, please be in touch to talk more about it. Thank you. Uh, here's another question. Um, this is regarding um, uh, Putney Road in Brattleboro. Putney Road is uh, scheduled for a major update, including provisions for sidewalks and improved bike lanes. Uh, yet VTrans continues to require highway design standards that prioritize cars and maintain high traffic speeds instead of meeting the needs of all users. Will you advocate for complete street design standards for access permits so pedestrians and cyclists will be able to use the road safely. I think I'll take that one. Um, I was the lead sponsor of the uh, Complete Streets legislation that passed the House. I think it was in 2011. So that's been, you know, a really big thing for me. Um, I've been paying close attention to Putney Road. I, I have actually um, the plans for Putney Road that Gary Goodemote brought to me when I was first elected that had already been on the books for, I don't know how many years before that. And I think they've definitely been modified. I know that um, the bicyclists, there's been a lot of conversation about accommodating bicyclists uh, and the whole plan of the roundabouts is to slow traffic down. So uh, there's also, I think VTrans has agreed to put in temporarily um, a, a crosswalk and some, I'm not exactly sure, I think at the Hennefords, because that's been a big issue that people can't cross the road right now. And then it's not going to, the construction is not gonna happen for a few more years. So I, 
I am watching this closely, making sure that that it does follow complete streets principles, that it is, does not prioritize cars over bicyclists. We all need to um, be accommodated by our transportation system. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one more. There's a, a question uh, uh, in the question and answer box. Uh, this is for you too, actually, um, Molly. Um, when will local transportation be available? Seniors are having a hard time going to medical appointments. Well, there is local transportation. I mean, the buses are running. Uh, what is actually um, just started to happen, there's a um, program in Montpelier pilot project that just started in January, uh, which is a um, demand response transit. So instead of three fixed routes in the in around the city of Montpelier, uh, you can call the, the bus and, and the bus will come and take you to where you want to go. It's sort of an Uber, except that the, the, the driver is an employee of the transit company. Uh, these are the, it came out about from these um, mobility and innovation transportation grants that the Agency of Transportation has. And I just put um, our sustainability coordinator, Stephen Dawson, in touch with the agency to begin the conversation about how we could do that in Brattleboro. And uh, the um, head of Southeastern Vermont Transit is very interested. I know a board member, the board members are very interested. So it's a process. Um, they, it, it requires uh, a lot of community engagement, but that is one, I think, solution to our transit problem in Vermont to have um, demand response transit. In, in everywhere eventually. It's um, so, but right now I, I'd be interested to know what the problem is because the, 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 the Medicaid and uh, elders and disabled transportation is, um, is going on right now. So if somebody would like to contact me with a problem, I'm happy to, to try to help. Thank you. Um, Representative Marwicki. Thanks. You know, one thing I would add on to that is um, there's a multi-state effort that's been ongoing called the Transportation Climate Initiative. Uh, this is a planning uh, group that's trying to put efforts together so states will have the resources to either enhance or create a statewide transportation initiative. And right now our governor has chosen not to join this and we're trying to convince him that this is a good opportunity for us. It's, it's about 14 states uh, and it, it has a, a track record. We did something like this about 15 years ago that's um, been funding our electric uh, efficiency efforts. Um, but we're hoping that the, the governor can see that this is, this is a, a beneficial thing that will give Vermont the resources to actually create uh, a statewide transportation system a public transportation system, which we don't have. And we know the challenges of, of, of a, a rural state creating something like this, but I think the first step is for us to join in with these other states that are doing the, this. And if you wanna find out more about it, you can look at the Georgetown University uh, Climate uh, tr the Transportation Climate Initiative website. It's being housed at Georgetown University right now, but it's, it's 14 states in the Northeast uh, that are gathered together. And it's something I think Vermont should, should be part of. Thank you. Um, at this time, I would like to invite any of you if you have any other comments, uh, something, anything we missed that you feel uh, is important to get out there to, to folks. Uh, Representative Goldman. Thank you. Um, I just want to circle back to Act 156, the Older Vermonters Act. Um, one thing that we've done in healthcare and is going through the budget process is supports for nursing um, and for training more nurses for our state. Um, we're down 5,000 nursing physicians in our state, which is an enormous number. And as we age, we're going to really have to look really closely at that. So we put considerable money into developing our nursing workforce and hopefully keep people at home. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, the time flew by, uh, uh, Representative Kornheiser. 
I think Representative Sebelius' name was up before mine. Hand was up before mine. Oh, I didn't see that. I'm sorry. Representative Sebelia. Thanks. Uh, I want to circle back to the Department of Labor uh, IT issue and kind of expand on it uh, and just talk about our committee has actually looked at a proposal that's come in from the administration around establishing um, uh, an IT infrastructure fund, um, which needs a little work still, the proposal. Uh, but when we think about um, when we think about funding IT, uh, there's no good mechanism. Uh, and if Representative Coffee was here, she would tell you that you know the institutions committee oftentimes catches it. That's not a great place uh, for it. And a lot of our IT infrastructure in the state is old, um, really old, as we see with Department of Labor. Um, and and it's an ongoing. Um, it's just part of how we provide government service to folks now. And so this is systemically an issue that uh, we, need to, we need to do a, a much better job of. And it's something I think that uh, our committee is, is continuing and will continue to look at um, going forward. So uh, it's part of modernizing, I guess, modernizing yeah. our government. Oh, and there we go. We've got Senator White. We've got oh, I still, I'm still gonna hold my turn, even though I offered-, offered Yes, Representative Kornheiser. Yes, um, absolutely agree with you, Laura. And it's not just about providing quality services to Vermonters. It's also about understanding how well we do our job right now. We don't have an IT system that can create meaningful reports for us. Um, so really looking forward to investing in that. I just also wanna name that a big priority for me in the legislature right now is around opiates um, and treatment, recovery, harm reduction, workforce, all of it. And I think that is, you know, a major issue for Wyndham County that gets into every last corner of all of our lives. And so I just want to make sure that you all know that really the whole county delegation talks about that and is focused on that. And we are trying to move that needle, even though um, none of us are doing it in our particular committees of jurisdiction right now. So thank you very much for all of you for coming today and happy to follow up offline with anyone. Senator White. Just to follow up on what um, Emily Long and Emily Kornheiser just alluded to, we have a really strong uh, Wyndham County delegation and we meet twice a month, the whole delegation meets. So if people have particular issues that they're concerned about, get them to get the issue to one of us and we'll talk about it in our delegation meeting. We try to focus on things that are particularly um, effective that have a particular impact on Wyndham County and our problems here. So please get, get your questions to us and we'll talk about them because we, re, we really do work together and try to solve the issues as Emily just said. Thank you. Anything else? Well, thank you so much to all of you for being uh, with us this morning. It's, it's uh, one of the things I love best about uh, Vermont is that we have access to our, our elected officials and uh, we can have these conversations. Um, it's, it's so important as you all know. And, and so thank you for being with us um, and thank you all out there for uh, attending um, and for your uh, great questions. Um, we look forward to more conversation and I hope you all have a good, a good week. Thank you, Greg. Thanks thank everyone you. for being here.